welcome back once again. This is another edition of Indie Reads TV brought to you by Pages Promotions. Season 2. Um, this edition of, of Indie Reads, we have an awesome author in the studio. His name is Charles Stern. This would be him. Um, and he's going to talk to us about his books. And um, primarily, he writes in magic realism. So this is going to be really... Um, fun and unusual because magic realism is not one of those genres that's really widely read or understood. So we're going to have a great conversation tonight. Thank you, Chuck, for being here. Okay. I Thanks appreciate for asking it. Me. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so first thing I, I want to do is um, talk about how you got started in writing. Um, you know, has, has this been something that's always been a part of your life or is it something that came you know, after you hit adulthood or hit your stride in your professional career, uh, how did you decide that you were going to sit down and write a book? Well, I think I've thought about writing a book sometimes, but uh, um, I'm a psychologist, so and I've been working in mental health since I was 19. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I've experienced a lot of things in my professional career and in my personal life as well. And so people would say, why don't you write a book? But as a psychologist, I wasn't doing research, per se, um, beyond my dissertation and so on. So um, I thought about some of the things I have learned mm -hmm. as a psychologist or learned in my uh, personal life. And I thought, well, I can't really do research, per se, but I could possibly write novels. You know, I could write fiction and incorporate some of those things into that. So I started... Um, doing that. I uh, was working at a clinic and I started working um, in a private practice instead. So I stopped working at the clinic and started uh, taking one night a week to read, to write rather. And um, that's how I got started. Excellent. <clears throat> um, so you write magic realism, although I know you've also written a children's book as well. Right. But um, let's set that aside for a second. Now let's talk about magic realism. Um, as as a writer, how do you define magic realism? How do you explain it to people? Like when we do book festivals, mm -hmm. when you meet people and you you want to explain it to them, how do you let them know what magic realism is about? Well, I think magic realism is, uh, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it, but uh, my view of it anyway is that there's um, a kind of real life type story, but there's a lot of odd perhaps magical things that happen during the story. And um, um, when I was, one of the reasons I wrote some of that, I enjoyed uh, other uh, authors' um, uh, writing of uh, magic realism, like uh, Haruki Murakami, who's the Japanese uh, author, and uh, <coughs> um, Allende, or um, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, so I read a lot of their books and got an idea about how to do it mm -hmm. from that because I had never written before. So um, I remember uh, one time <clears throat> I went to a financial seminar and the uh, person running it said that, uh, you know, why would you take advice from somebody who's not wealthy about how to be how to become wealthy. Sure. Yeah. 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 And so I thought, well, that probably would apply here. So I decided to read or listen to on audiobook sometimes because I would do that when I was writing, r driving, and uh, get an idea about how the uh, well-published and well-respected authors uh, wrote sure. magic realism. I, of course, my own, I put my own uh, stamp on it, but, uh, um, but I got I, I learned a lot by listening to audio yeah. books and reading other one, one of the biggest things that we <coughs> always, you know, as a writing coach, I always tell people is if you want to write something, read in that genre so that you can right. understand the flow and you can understand what people do. What drew you to magic realism as a genre as opposed to all the other 32 other genres out there? Uh, well, I had read uh, years ago, I had read um, <coughs> Gabriel, Mar Gabriel Gar Garcia Marquez's uh, um, 100 Years of Solitude. And um, I reread it and uh, got hooked on that. And then mm -hmm. I heard about uh, Murakami and I read a couple of his books and um, they were just 
mesmerizing for me. And yeah. so, like I said, I would go through and um, um, try to see how they wrote their books and uh, didn't copy what they wrote, but, but I tried to get the idea of how to do it. Sure, yeah. It, it, <coughs> imitating <coughs> others in, in the craft is how we get better at it. Sure. You know, thousands of authors are out there trying to be Stephen King. Right. And, and it, it's just how we do it. I mean, it's sure. how we do anything in life, how we do right. um, sports or art or anything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the individual novels. We'll kind of go through synopsis okay. and, and then... Um, go from there. So, The First Feminist and Other Likely Stories. This is a great collection of short stories. Um, tell me tell me the idea that brought this to the front. What, what made you decide that you wanted to do this collection of shorts? Well, I had some stories that I could uh, use for uh, uh, short stories. I, I didn't know if I had enough of them, so I wrote some more. But... Um, I had a couple stories that were actually uh, true stories, and uh, uh, I had actually written something about them in the past, um, or I had written them in the past. I revised them for this book, but mm -hmm. uh, um, so I had some stories that I had written some time ago. Not thinking about publishing, just was interested in doing that, and um, uh, then. I had a few of those stories, but then I th thought that wasn't enough for a book, so I started writing some other stories. So there's a mixture of true stories, stories that are based on true stories, and um, just pure fiction. Excellent. And they have different kinds of approaches. You know, they're not all the same. They're not all you know magic realism in, this, in these particular stories. But yeah, um, I and when I read it, when I was working <coughs> with you to publish it, I had a blast with it because it it is so wonderfully diverse. Mm -hmm. And there, there are little things in there that tickle different parts of your funny bone. It's not all mm -hmm. the same brand of humor or the same perspective. It's a little bit, some of it's humorous and some of it's not. Right. And I, I really like that eclectic mix. I, I think you did a great job with yeah. it. And I also added uh, haiku uh, poems. And, yes. Uh, so I do um, Japanese uh, ink painting. It's called sumi. And uh, so... In between the chapters are, um, in, in between most chapters, there's a, a haiku poem and a, a, a painting of bamboo yep. primarily. I was just um, going to pull one of these out while you're talking so that people can at home can kind of get an idea of what that looks like. Um, and then there are some of these in here that are in <coughs> black and white, and some of them are in color. Yeah, there are some color. Um, yep, here's one right here. And the, the idea that you had to mix the haiku with the Japanese art, I think, was really cool. It's a nice way to divide up the mm -hmm. short stories, kind of, a, as I call them, palette cleansers. Uh -huh. You know, that, right. that thing in between the next short story, I, I think, is a great idea. Um, Rooster's Tale is your beautiful little children's tale. It's all written in rhyme. Right. I love this. <laughs> Where did, it, th this is this is great. I love this story. It's about a, a rooster who sneezes his tail off. Where did you get the idea for that? When I was a <clears throat> young child, my grandfather would say, um, the very first few lines in the book are what he would say. Um, it said, so, uh, Something like, uh, I don't I'm trying to remember there all of it, but it's, uh, um, yeah. A long, long, long ago and very far off, a rooster sneezed and his tail flew off. And that's what my grandfather would say to me when I was, I don't know, six, five, I don't know. At any rate, I happened to uh, remember that when I was at a, uh, at a reading. Uh, there was a couple of people reading children's books. And while they were reading their books, I remembered that, statement that my uh, grandfather or the story that my grandfather told. So I wrote, jotted it down on a piece of paper I had, and then I just kept writing and basically just adding the, to it. Or just wrote the book. Um, so here's there's nice here's illustrations that. too. Yeah, w we found a, a beautiful illustrator when we were working on this together, and she's just incredible. <laughs> she did a great job with it. Um, here's the this is this is one of my favorite pictures in here. 
um, the rooster and the goat. <laughs> I love him. He's great. Um, so yeah, this is this is a great children's story. I, I bought these for my nieces and nephews <laughs> and sent them off. They're they're fabulous. Um, and then uh, where is it? There, there it is. <laughs> Juxtaposition paradox. This was your first yes. uh, novel. Yes. And uh, the first magic realism. And I know that right. it's currently in a rewrite net right now. Yes, I'm, I'm updating it, so to speak. Um, so let, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, a, quite a few uh, authors will go through this period of, oh, I, I think I can improve that or I can make it um, stronger, better, faster, you know, the right. $6 million man approach sure. to writing. Sure. Um, I know you were working with another coach um, to get their perspective on it. What made you decide that now was the time to rewrite it? Was it because of the influence of this coach or because you felt like there was enough distance to kind of look at it again? Well, it had been a while since I had written it, and uh, looking back at it, I thought it was my first book, So, and, and I only wrote it in like three or four months. So um, There it is. Yeah. So it was a, a quick write. It was my first one, and when I looked back through it, I thought, you, you know, it could be uh, better now that I'm now that I've learned a lot more about writing novels, sure, yeah, I, I thought, well, I think I'm going to just uh, not rewrite the whole thing, but just to uh, um, fix some areas that I think uh, should be improved. So that's when I asked uh, another person to go through it just to um, get another perspective, and uh, and uh, he gave some um, good advice, and so I think I'm going to try to um, follow some of what he said. I don't agree with everything, but I, I right. think uh, I think I want to. Uh, Try to make it uh, tighter or better. Uh, I guess. Yeah, whatever that say, yeah. whatever that uh, six million right, dollar man thing right, is. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the um, the next book I want to talk about is Finder in Hell World. Um, this is actually the third book because you wrote okay. the children's story in between the two magic realisms. Right. Um, so let's let's talk about Finder. It's um, it looks more like it's Hell World from the the, the um, cover. Yeah, it, it's actually Finder in Hell, in Hell World, World, a love, a story. love story. Yeah, um, but we we abbreviate together I because know. we've been friends for so long. I know. So, I know. I know. so, um, so tell me about the um, uh, the synopsis of this book, and <coughs> and then after the synopsis, give me an idea of how you got the the imagery for this main character, because I think he's really cool. Well, I don't remember what stimulated my idea about Finder, but so I, I know I was listening to something or reading something. I just don't rem even remember what it was, but somehow it popped into my mind. It, it, it had to do with somebody finding something, and then I thought... Um, Finder, which should be it would be a title or a, a nickname for somebody, Finder. And then I thought, well, you know, um, I've read stories where people found things, or um, I remember reading a story, one, or actually a true story, about somebody in uh, New Jersey who, um, in in the Pine Barrens, which is one of the largest forests in the country, um, apparently if you're on the trail or on the road if you walk you know 50 yards into the into the uh, forest you uh, can get lost mm -hmm. and um, so this guy he lived in the pine barrens or near the pine barrens all his life and he actually was taught by a native american gentleman who was uh, very adept shall we say at all the native american things so he, sure. he knew how to track and all that so uh, he would find things and then he later on branched out and would you know, police would come and ask him to find things and whatever. So, or find people mostly. And so, um, I thought about somebody named Finder, but I thought, well, there's stories about people who find things, but I'm thinking that's usually because, uh, like, you ask somebody to find something that you lost or mm -hmm. whatever, or a person that you can't find, or they got kidnapped or lost or something. And so um, I thought, well, how can I reverse that and uh, make it more interesting? And so I decided that Finder is somebody who could find objects, animals, people, whatever they're lost, stolen, uh, or whatever, um, 
but it, not because the person that lost them asked them to do it, but because the person who, or the, because the thing or person that was lost or the animal wanted to be returned. So it's more of a um, <clears throat> uh, a calling from the missing right. object or the missing entity, spirit, yes. whatever, to find her hey, find me, reunite me with right. the place I'm missing yeah. rather than the other way around. Yeah, they're not necessarily asking him to do it necessarily, they're just sort of just wanting to go back, and then he will detect that um, need to be returned to its rightful place or mm-hmm. owner or whatever, uh, with the exception of, of if it's uh, something where he shouldn't return them, you know, something's being abused or right. you know, whatever. Um, but so he, he's gone around finding things Sometimes he would find water where they needed water. Sometimes he'd find uh, a lost child or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, various uh, items or people, whatever. So, uh, but then he comes to a town. Um, he hitchhikes a ride with a truck driver. And he comes to a town called Perfection. And uh, Perfection is very strange. The people are very strange. Um, they... Uh, um, once the adults are strange, the children are pretty much like children until they're about 12 years old, but somehow they change and uh, are not very uh, um, sociable, they uh, are not very emotional, uh, and so on. And, and so Finder detects that there's something missing uh, that they've lost because it's the entire town. Right. Uh, everybody in the town is not like one or two people. And so he, he detects that there's something missing, so he stays in the town, and he meets a girl, Molly, who she's the only one in town that doesn't seem to be like that, who's an adult. And um, so uh, the hell world part was that there's an adjacent area to the town that's all barren, and it's barren because of uh, pestilence and fire and right. you know, all kinds of stuff. And, and there's a big, it used to be a, a um, housing project, um, a, uh, a subdivision, and, uh, but it got destroyed. But there was a, a big rock at the uh, road, at where the road started into the uh, mm-hmm. Kind of a, a, a was, signpost delineating yeah, the area. It was a huge area. rock that yeah. was there. So, so uh, because weird things would happen out there in that area, um, somebody painted hell world on the rock like you know here's the entrance to right, hell world right. kind of thing yeah <clears throat> so finder and molly his girlfriend um they have to go find out what is missing and try to return it to the town and that's now one of one works. of the elements that i love about this story is that it's not <coughs> to hear you tell it it almost sounds dark and foreboding, and and there's mm-hmm. this this cloud kind of thing over it, but it's not that way at all. No. Y- you've done a really great job um, mixing in these moments of comic relief almost, mm-hmm. and and that I think is the twist in the magic realism that happens because mm-hmm. it's not perfection is not your average town it's right. not mayberry it there's weird stuff happening That's there right. yep. even before finder figures out that right. there are things that need to be found and so that that touch of magic realism mm-hmm. mixed with the humor i think is the, the really great um uh, part of, of how this book comes together for readers i think right. that that's why it's so enjoyable to read well in addition you know the uh there's a lot of uh world mythology mixed in some mm-hmm. of it's some of it is obvious some of it stated you know like uh, a, a mythological person's name or something or something like that but there's some that's in there that you might not know that it's based on some mythology just if you didn't know the myth right but it doesn't matter i mean it, the, the whole point is it, it it helps to move the fo- the story forward and it gives a different i think at least uh, at least a different dimension um an added dimension to the story so um, there's these weird things that happen um, but also a lot a lot of it's based on some mythologies as well yeah absolutely I I saw traces of that when I was reading it there were there were pieces where I went oh yeah I've heard of that story before but you you put a different spin on it that made it really fun right there's a lot of things that people would probably 
miss or not understand that it's connected to a mythology, but they don't understand the story. Right. Yeah. Um, Talk to me a little bit about the um, the idea of publishing and and why you chose to go indie rather than shop it to an agent and try to go through a traditional house, one of the big five in New York. Well, I um, I had not been a writer, so um, I didn't know that I would be able to get published by one of the big publishers. I didn't know uh, anyway, but uh, I'd heard stories. I'd, I've known people that had written books and submitted them and never got published and always got rejected. And um, In fact, I remember I, since I've published some of these, I talked to one woman who was an author, and she had submitted uh, one of her books to uh, one of the publishers, and the uh, person that looked at it said they liked it, but they asked her, well, who's your um, um, agent? agent? And she said, I don't have one. So they wouldn't publish it unless she went through an agent. So there was all kinds of complications about sure. that. And I'm busy. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, I didn't want to have to struggle with anybody. And uh, if they got, I wanted to get it published if it could be. And you came along and yeah. helped me out. It's a- I absolutely. It. And the work is absolutely worthy. I love it. Um, I'm looking forward to your next piece as yeah. soon as you finish the yeah, juxtaposition I, paradox right. rewrite. Yeah. Um, you're part of our writing group. Can you, we have about six minutes left. Can you talk a little bit about the experience of writing in community, um, how that's benefited you, or what m- perhaps some pitfalls that you found in doing that? Well, I think it helps with other people uh, writing together. Number one, it's you know it helps just to have time that you set aside to go do that with other people. But also, uh, you know, we talk about things, and uh, sometimes uh, we give each other ideas or, um, you know, maybe read each other's uh, material, at least parts of it or whatever. Um, like one of the other authors the other a couple weeks ago one asked me if I could read her short story and uh, just give her feedback, and I did that. And um, I think she appreciated the feedback I gave her. Mm-hmm. And I, I appreciate the feedback I get, you know, from... Uh, people. Sometimes I remember uh, one time I was uh, writing one of the uh, short stories for the short story book and uh, I, I showed it to the, that particular story to the other authors and uh, one of them read it out loud and everybody's laughing and thought mm-hmm. it was funny. Yeah, and so yeah that so was fun. That, that helped me to, to sure. realize that some people at least are going to think it's funny. Sure, yeah. yeah. It, <coughs> when you get that feedback f- from other readers Maybe they're not authors. Maybe they're also readers right. or both. Um, having that feedback, I think, helps to hone your craft, which right. is why we created the group sure. to begin with. Yeah. Um, what, what's what been the biggest pitfall in writing for you? What's What's been the biggest challenge for you in putting these books together? Well, I guess more time than anything. Just have, you know, I'm so busy that sometimes I have difficulty with uh, having enough time. That's why the writing group has helped because most weeks I show up there. Mm-hmm. Once in a while, work gets in the way and I can't. Sure. But almost all the time I'm I'm there. And um, so. Th- yeah, it's, most, it's, most weeks times, you're there before I am. Yeah, I know. So. But, for, for, but finding other times during the week is more difficult um, just because of my work issues, schedules. Right. But um, um, when I do have time, you know, if there's some, there's a gap in my uh, schedule for some reason, you know, a patient's not coming or I don't have a hospital to go to to evaluate somebody, uh, whatever, uh, I might take a little bit of time writing. Mm-hmm. I go to a coffee shop every morning. I do a lot of uh, expert witness in court for uh, evaluations and expert witness in court. So I go to a coffee shop every morning and prepare for court, but if I have time after I do that, um, I'll get, squeeze in a little I'll, bit of writing. I'll time. squeeze in a little bit of writing if I can. Um, the other day, oddly enough, I didn't have to go to court, so but I went to the coffee shop anyway, and I wrote. Yeah. Instead. So that that routine, <coughs> um, setting aside time and finding routine, that would be one of the strongest recommendations you'd have for other authors. Right. Yeah, and uh, of course, getting feedback is important too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
after you finish the juxtaposition paradox rewrite, do you have another project in mind? I know that at one time you were working on another project and then you kind of sidelined it for a little while mm -hmm. to reevaluate it. Are you going to go back to working on that or do you think you might create something new? Um, well, um, the Finder and Hell World story, um, I thought I might write a sequel to it. Oh, great. And I did actually start writing it, but um, I got to a point where I have the characters and they're all starting to show up in the story, but I'm trying to decide which character I want to do certain things. And mm -hmm. um, I, so, um, so I, I set that aside while I'm working on the uh, updating the uh, juxtaposition, juxtaposition paradox. Um, and by doing that, setting it aside, I'm getting ideas, you know, I, I'm sure. Oh, well, yeah, I could do that. Kind of letting it simmer in the back right. of your brain a little yeah. bit. And things will come up like I might be watching a movie, you know, and there might be one thing that happens in that movie and it'll just spark something. Oh, I could that that might be a good idea. Maybe I could do something like that. It wouldn't be the same thing, but it, sure, it sparks sure. the idea. Uh, and, uh, well, just like in our reading, <clears throat> you know, we emulate right. um, different pieces of what we read. Mm -hmm. Same thing in, in everyday life, film or right. art. Right. I know you go to the DIA frequently. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that there are a lot of inspirational pieces there for you as well. Right. And, you know, my work, I run into things <laughs> that, <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> that no one would ever thought of before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it, it, I think it's interesting that um, truth is is so frequently stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. And and um, I know some of the stories you've told me, there's no way that could happen in real <laughs> life. And then when you tell me it does happen, it does, it, yeah. it's surprising. Right. Well, then the short story has a couple of really uh, true stories. One of them uh, is uh, a former patient of mine that wanted me to write something for him. Yeah. And uh, he and his wife wanted me to write it. And so I did. That was... a quite some time ago, but that's one of the ones I sort of resurrected to uh, put in the short story book. Right. Um, and it, it's pretty, um, what's it, I don't know how rough, to, raw. it's a rough, rough yeah. type story, yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, and then there's a, there, there's one story in there, for example, that is basically what happened to me, that I, that I you know, met this yeah. guy. And, that and, one's kind of edgy as well. You know, Bit, so yeah. I, I don't want to give it away, so no, I, I want people to right. read it. But we, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Okay. I appreciate you being here. I Thank you for you coming in. Me. It's been right. super fun to have you, and I look forward to writing with you next week. All right. It's been fun. Thank you. All right.